are slightly down, but the Lord is here with us. I remember hearing of a preacher who invited a very well-known speaker to come, and that well-known speaker was used to having great crowds come to hear him. But on that particular Sunday, there were very few who turned up, and he was quite miffed, to say the least, and he turned to the pastor in the pulpit, and he said, did you not tell people I was coming? And the pastor said, no, I didn't, but the word must have leaked out somewhere or another. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're reading from Ephesians chapter 6, again this morning, Ephesians chapter 6, and uh, the passage of Scripture that has been the focus of our consideration and studies in the last uh, few weeks. In verse 10 and following, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. If you keep your finger in there in your Bible, and just turn over quickly to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, this passage throws a little bit of light on what we're going to be looking at this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 3. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. We know the Lord will bless the reading of his word. Please join me in prayer. Gracious Lord, we long to hear from you this morning that your word might come with power to our souls and bring to us the very message that you in your great wisdom know that every one of us need to hear. May our minds and hearts be open to receive with meekness this engrafted word that is able to save our souls. Lord, hold back the distractions of the enemy. How easily our minds wander. How easily, Lord, we become obsessed in our thinking with matters that really don't have any bearing upon our spiritual good. Lord, focus us on Christ. Give to us to that end the power of the Holy Ghost, both preacher and hearer, for we ask in Jesus' name. And the people of God said, Amen. Verse 17, the second part of the verse, is what we're looking at this morning of Ephesians chapter 6, where the Apostle Paul urges the believers and urges us to take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. How did we get to this study initially? We got to this place by considering in previous months, the kind of pits into which God's people fall at times and find themselves in. 
pits of darkness and doubt and depression and despair and pits that are difficult, if not impossible, in ourselves to get our way out of. And by that I mean that there are times when, as the people of God, we find ourselves greatly distressed, like David was at Ziklag when he came back to that city and found it burned with fire and his, his wives and children taken away with all their possessions. We find ourselves as God's people in situations like that. The Christian life is not one that is a rose petal pathway to glory. We are not carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease, as the hymn writer said. But there is in our lives the occasion, there are many occasions, when we find ourselves in the storm, in the dark, walking through the fire and the flood. And as a consequence, we find ourselves at times distressed and in trouble of mind and soul. That occurs sometimes because of our own sin. It occurs on other occasions simply by the circumstances of life that come our way over which we have no control. But we also thought that it also happens because we are in a great conflict with the powers of darkness. The Christian life is depicted in Scripture as a warfare. Find the words of Paul to his young understudy Timothy urging him to war a good warfare, to fight the good fight of faith and to lay hold on eternal life. And we are reminded even from this passage in Ephesians that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Our struggle is not on the human level against individuals or people, although Satan can use people and that is one of the primary ways in which he operates in our culture and in our society. But beyond the instrument that Satan uses is the power of Satan himself. We wrestle against principalities and powers and against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And so it is inevitable that in a time of warfare there were going to be dark times, difficult times, times of struggle and times of real intense conflict. But the Lord has not left us to face this alone. He has provided us, as we have seen in this chapter, in which Paul, in a more detailed fashion than in any other epistle that he wrote, uh, gives to us something about the conflict in which we find ourselves engaged as believers and that on a daily basis, and will be engaged until we see the Lord. He reminds us not only that we have a strength that we can lay hold of that is not our own. It is the very strength of the Lord. And we're told to be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Because the arm of flesh will fail us. And we dare not trust our own. But we must also put on the armor of God. And we have looked at the various parts of this armor in our recent studies. The belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel of peace. We have looked at the shield of faith. And we have looked at the helmet of salvation. And this morning we're going to look at this other piece of armor. I'm going to just correct myself in a minute having said that. The sword of the spirit which is the word of God. Why am I going to correct myself? Because strictly speaking the sword is not a piece of armor. The sword is a weapon. The other pieces of armor are to armor us, very obviously, that we might be protected, that we might be defended. But the sword, on the other hand, is a weapon. A weapon that we can and should wield, not only for our spiritual defense, but for going on the offense against the enemy. You see, a soldier isn't just as it were, lined up with other soldiers to stand there and be protected against whatever the enemy is throwing at him, whatever barrage of missiles are coming his way. But he will hear the command, the line will advance. And they will go forward. And their intent in going forward is to overcome and to destroy the enemy that has come against them. And the very fact that we have a defense, an offensive weapon, 
tells us something this morning as Christians about what we are called to do and what is possible for us in this warfare. We are not merely called upon to adopt a defensive position and to hold our ground and to stand firm. No, we are called upon to go forward. If I might digress for a moment, brothers and sisters, and say to you that here is a trap into which we as evangelicals can often fall. We look at the powers of hell that are amassed against us and amassed against Christ and the gospel and our culture and our society, and we become merely obsessed with holding our ground, with being in a defensive position of building up the walls and digging the trenches and the foxholes and, and all the rest of it. Now don't misunderstand me, we do need to stand firm. We do need to resist the pressure that is against us. But God has called us, brothers and sisters, not merely to hold our ground, but to gain ground. He has called us to advance and to go forward against the enemy of our souls and the enemy of all of men's souls, Satan himself. You see, if a church becomes merely obsessed with holding its ground, it becomes introspective and inward looking. And as a consequence of that inward lookingness, if I can use such a term, there is a tendency for the church to begin to shrivel up. We're just obsessed with what we are and what we have and the ground that we hold and we fail to take into consideration the words of our Savior when he said, lift up your eyes and look on the fields for they are white already to harvest. The harvest truly is plenteous but the laborers are few. Pray ye the Lord of harvest that he might thrust forth laborers into his harvest. The, the words that our Savior spoke, the last words to his disciples before he ascended to glory, what were they? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And the word today that God, I think, would have us to hear is the word that the Lord commanded Moses to give to the people of Israel as they stood on the banks of the Red Sea, a sea in front of them, mountains on either side of them, a pursuing enemy behind them. And what was God's word to Moses? Speak to the children of Israel that they go forward. Go forward. Yes, the enemies there. The impossibilities are there. But in the name of our God, we are called upon to go forward. I fear today, and I feel, and I've seen this and heard this from uh, from ministers of the gospel, good men in many ways, faithful ministers of the word. And they look now upon their churches as, to use the words of Ezekiel, little sanctuaries. And this is what God has just called us to do, to have this little sanctuary where we feed the people of God and, and so on and so forth. Well, it is true in a sense that the church does become a sanctuary for the saints in the sense that that is where they come uh, to, to feel safe and to be encouraged and to be built up and to be fed and all the rest of it. But my friends, whatever happened to the Great Commission? Whatever happened to the very purpose for which the Lord Jesus Christ instituted his church and left it in this world? It is not that we might shrink back. It is that we might go forward. Onward, Christian soldiers marching as to war. And we sang that this morning in one of our hymns, didn't it? Encamped upon the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers, rise and press the battle. Press the battle. Go forward. That's why we've got a sword. We have a fight that we need to engage in that is not merely defensive. To hold back the enemy from taking the ground, but it is offensive in that we are to go forward to actually take ground from the enemy. That's why we're in the world. So the, uh, the armor and the weapons are given not only for protection against Satan's attacks, not only that we might be protected, but that we might prevail when we attack the forces of hell. That's the picture that Jesus 
was drawing when he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The church is not there portrayed as being defensive, but offensive. Going forward with the assurance that the gates of hell will not be able to stand against the onward march of God's army, wielding God's weapons and the power of God's spirit. I challenge my own heart as I challenge you, your hearts this morning. To what extent do we take seriously the Great Commission and the call to go forward and the call to advance the kingdom of Christ wherever we're at, we're at, individually and collectively as a corporate body of the Lord's people. We're not only to defend ourselves spiritually and to defend the truth of God, but we are literally and very deliberately, I use the word because it's a scriptural word, we are to destroy, to destroy satanic powers that come against us. Well, I read to you this morning from 2 Corinthians chapter 10. The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power. Listen, to destroy. <laughs> Did you know the church's mission? I know this is, this is going to shock many people this morning. The church's mission is in one sense a destructive one. And I know that that's not popular today. We've got so nice about everything. You can't use militaristic language anymore. But are we not to walk in the steps of the Savior? Why did he come into this world? Listen to the Apostle John. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might do what? Destroy. Destroy the works of the devil. We go forward, brethren and sisters, and our intention is to destroy what? Look at verse 5 of 2 Corinthians 10. To destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Now that's very militaristic, isn't it? But that's the truth of God. God hasn't given us a weapon for decoration. Now, there are all kinds of swords that you can get today, and there are ceremonial swords that are worn with ceremonial uniforms, and they're nice to look at. The Word of God is not given to us as something merely to admire. It is given to us to use. And when you use a sword, you're not using a sword for, uh, uh, you know, to, to smooth people's feathers. To, to, to make sure that they're not ruffled. The sword does something. It cuts. <laughs> and we are to recognize that we have been given a commission and we have been given a weapon to advance against the forces of darkness, to destroy the works of the devil. Our Savior did that at the cross when he destroyed principalities. Here's the word again. He destroyed principalities and powers and he made a show of them openly triumphing over them in his cross. The book of Colossians tells us. And the Lord Jesus Christ, by the power of his Spirit and through the instrumentality of his people upon this earth continues to oppose the works of darkness and to overcome Satan's power and Satan's purposes to deceive, to dominate, and to damn the souls of men and women. You and I are instruments in Christ's war. He is the captain of our salvation. He came to overthrow the works of darkness. And in Romans 16, Paul writes under inspiration to the believers that the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. It's the God of peace who does it. He does it against Satan. But he crushes Satan where? Under the feet of his people. God continues to overcome Satan in the lives of his people. When he comes against us with his lies, with his insinuations, with his deceptions, with all of that, he continues by his grace, through his power to overcome Satan's activity in or against, if you like, his people in their lives. 
but he not only continues to overcome sin in the lives of his people, he continues to overcome sin, listen, this is crucial, through the ministry of his people. 1 John chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. John, as he writes under inspiration to the believers, he writes specifically to a number of categories, and among the categories are young men. And he says to them, by the way, that's not young merely in the natural sense, but young in the sense of, spur of, of the spiritual sense, young in the faith. And he says, I've written unto you young men, he says this twice, you have overcome the evil one. Believers are, are to overcome, oppose and overcome the evil one. And they're to do so in the strength which God supplies through his eternal sin, son, to quote the words of Charles Wesley's hymn. And you know it's interesting when the Lord Jesus, and you can look this up, I'll give you the reference, Luke chapter 10, verses 17 through 19, the Lord Jesus had sent out the 70 disciples to go before him to preach the word, to preach the gospel of the kingdom. And he said this to them, and I have to confess, this, this statement challenges me. It intrigues me, it interests me. He said, I give unto you powers. He sent them out to preach. He said, I give unto you power, listen, over all the power of the enemy. They're going out. They're going out to preach. They're going out to preach the gospel of Christ. The coming and advance of the kingdom of God. And to that end, Jesus said, I have given to you power over all the power of the enemy. We are to advance. Remember, and I say this again as an aside, but I think an important one, that our assault is against spiritual forces. It's against the wickedness and the wiles and the works of sin. It's not against flesh and blood. We are not opponents of mankind. We attack the forces that hold men captive with the purpose of destroying men. And it is out of love to men that we attack those forces. What are Satan's wiles? What are Satan's wiles and Satan's works? Well, it is to, as we have said, to deceive, to dominate, and eventually to destroy. And we go out against him in the name of the Lord and by the power of the Holy Spirit and with the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, to destroy the works of darkness in order that men who are led captive by his will or led captive to do his will are rescued and freed and delivered. And to that end, that's just the introduction. To that end, we have been given a weapon. And we have been reminded by Paul in 2 Corinthians 10 that our weapons are not the weapons of the flesh. They have not been conceived in the imaginations of men. They have not been prepared by human logic or human understanding or human wisdom. The weapon that God has given to us is defined for us by the Apostle here in Ephesians 6. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they are mighty through God. To the pulling down of strongholds, to the destruction of opinions and thoughts and imaginations that are raised against the knowledge of God. I want to spend some time in the next week or two over this, I think, vitally important subject. But this morning I just want to leave three thoughts with you on this. We must use the weapon, first of all, that has been prepared and provided for us by God. That sounds very simple and very basic. 
But is it not true that the tendency of the flesh, the ten when I use the flesh, I'm using it in the sense of our, our fallen nature, with all of its ways of thinking and understanding, with all of its wisdom, do we not, as we look out on evil forces that are out there to destroy and damn the souls of men and women and to attack the church of God and the truth of God, do, are we not often prone to try and resort to armaments and attitudes that are not of God in this battle against these satanic forces? That's why Paul insists in 2 Corinthians 10, the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. While we walk in the flesh, that is to say we walk in our bodies, we are still in the body. We do not war after the flesh because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're not. Human understanding, human philosophy, human wisdom and all of those things. Paul, when he went to Corinth, went into a culture that is not unlike our own. The Corinthian culture was, to say the very least, one of the most depraved and debauched in the Roman world of Paul's day. I've said before, and this may give you some insight into how depraved and Disgraceful the activities and the moral climate of Corinth was that even then in the Roman Empire, which was far from being a city set upon a hill because of its virtue, even then it was still considered to be an, an insult to be referred to as a Corinthian. That's how depraved Corinth was. Our society is maybe not quite there yet, but boy is it going fast in that direction. What did Paul do when he went to Corinth? Well, he practiced what he preached. The weapon that he took up against all the evidence of satanic corruption and satanic power, what was Paul's weapon? And he tells the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he says, when we went to Corinth, he says, I didn't come with excellency of speech or of wisdom. What's excellency of speech? That's oratory. What's excellency of wisdom? That's philosophy. Paul says, I didn't come to Corinth, this depraved, debauched city, sunk in the very pits of iniquity and depravity. He says, I didn't come there to be an orator or a philosopher. He says, I came simply to be a messenger. You brothers, when I came to you, I came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, listen, declaring unto you the testimony of God. Here's Paul wielding his spiritual weapon. And if you want to, if you want clarity as to exactly what he meant when he talked about declaring the testimony of God, here's Paul acting as a, as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Here's Paul advancing against the kingdom of darkness. And he's going and he is deliberately, consciously discarding the wisdom of the world. You go through 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and again he emphasizes that again and again. Not with the wisdom of words. Not with the wisdom of this world. He's discarding the weapons that are of the flesh. And he's taking up the weapon that is of divine power. And he's declaring the testimony of God. And he goes on to explain even more specifically what he means by that. And he says, I determined not to know anything among you but Jesus Christ and him crucified. Here's Paul and he's fighting a good fight of faith. And he's advancing against the kingdom of darkness. Brothers and sisters, as we pause to consider this morning where we're at as a society, and what we are called upon to do within an increasingly corrupt society, a society in which there is an increasing antagonism and opposition to historic and classical Christianity believed and preached by the Christian church for 2,000 years. We must avoid 
like the plague, the tendency to respond to that in the flesh with the arguments and with the attitudes and with the armaments of the flesh. What does Canada and the Western world and the entire world need in this day and generation? It needs a band of men and women who, like the Apostle Paul, will go out to this world discarding the weaponry of this world consciously turning away from the arguments and the philosophies and the reasonings and thoughts of this world and who will determine not to know anything but Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Amen? You agree? Paul proclaimed Jesus Christ and Him crucified. In other words, he preached the gospel. And Paul's definition here of our weapon that we wage to destroy the, the powers of darkness that are arrayed against the church and are opposed to the welfare of the good of men's souls. Our weapon is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now that very definition tells me two things about the Word of God. It tells me, first of all, that it is inspired by the Spirit of God. It's the sword of the Spirit. You see, men and women, the Scriptures, the Bible, is not merely a human book. It is not a collection of the best ideas of individuals. It is not the production of human imagination or human wisdom or human logic. This is the book of God. There is a sense in which we could say that the Bible has a dual authorship. It's perfectly true that when you read the prophecy of Isaiah, Isaiah wrote the prophecy of Isaiah. It's perfectly true when you read the book of Romans that Paul wrote the book of Romans. But Isaiah and Paul and every other author in the New Testament and in the Old wrote under the guidance, under the inspiration under the power of the Holy Spirit of God, so what they wrote was not their word, it was God's word. And it's vital that we get a hold of that. This is God's truth. This is the word of God that expresses a truth, truth that is unchanged and unchanging and unchangeable. Paul said in 2 Corinthians that holy men of God spoke as they were moved, as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So the scriptures are inspired by God, they're inspired by the Spirit. But being inspired by the Spirit, they are the instrument of the Holy Spirit to affect the purposes that God has for the souls of men and women. Here we're beginning to see just how vital the Holy Scriptures are in all that we are called to be and to do as Christians. The Spirit of God uses the Word of God which He Himself has inspired to advance the cause of God and to exalt the Christ of God. He uses the word to accomplish that purpose. That's why. That's why we're sent out into the world to preach the word. That's why we're sent out into the world to preach the gospel, which is essentially the central truth of this entire word. Because this word is God's weapon. This word inspired by the Holy Spirit is used by the Holy Spirit to affect in the souls of men and women the purposes of the Holy Spirit. And as Paul defined his own ministry and the reasons for that ministry and the call that God gave to him for that ministry, he said it was this, it was to turn men from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. Thus, brethren and sisters, I emphasize, I underline, I stress to you this morning that in our, in our warfare, we must not be tempted, 
as we attack the powers of darkness for their overthrow and for their destruction, not to resort to the weapons of the flesh, either the argumentation or the attitudes of the flesh, but to take up that weapon which God has prepared and which God has provided, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That brings me secondly to say this, we must use the weapon that has not only been provided for us, but we must use the weapon that God defines as powerful. You know, when Paul wrote those words in 2 Corinthians 10, when he said the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're not of the flesh, he seems in the following words to address an argument, or maybe I should say a temptation. The temptation being, well, if, uh, if they are not of the flesh, that kind of makes them less effective than we would want them to be. As if the weapons of the flesh can be compared at all to the weapons that God gives to us. He says to us, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they are not of the flesh, but they have divine power. That's what we want, isn't it? In our assault against the kingdom of darkness, what but divine power can push down the powers of darkness? What but the divine power can pull down the strongholds of the devil? Can overcome the opinions and the arguments and the thoughts and bring every thought and captivity to obedience to Christ? Brothers and sisters, nothing but divine power can do that. And God has given us a weapon which has power, divine power, because... It was divinely inspired, and it is the divine instrument of the Holy Spirit himself. This thought of the power of the Word of God is an interesting study. And that uh, power, the power of the Word, is, is taught to us in a number of ways in Scripture. It is taught to us, first of all, through the metaphors that the Lord uses to describe his Word. Note down this verse, Jeremiah 23, verse 29. Is not my word as a fire and as a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? What does that suggest to you? Power. Fire that can melt the iciest heart. A hammer that can break the most stubborn rock. God says this is the power that my word has. It says in the, in, in the New Testament with regard to the very words spoken by the Lord Jesus, words that are recorded for us in Scripture, preserved for us in the inspired Word of God. They said concerning Him, His Word was what? With power. Power. And then in, the, in Hebrews 4.12, another text you may want to take note of. For the Word of God is living, and it's active, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword, and it pierces to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and the joints and marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. What's that power? And the power of God's word is not only conveyed to us through the divinely inspired metaphors that God uses Himself to describe it, but its power is revealed in the miracles that are accomplished through it. What is the greatest miracle that we could possibly experience? It's the miracle of the new birth, of being born of God, of being made a partaker of the divine nature, of being born again of the Holy Spirit. In another verse of Scripture, in verse Peter 1, in verse 23, it tells us this, that we are born again. We are born again. This miracle of regeneration, this miracle of the new birth. We are born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, listen, by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Let me just bring to you this last point. The weapon that we use must not only be the one that God has provided and prepared for us, His Word, 
It must not only be the one that had truly has power, divine power, to pull down strongholds in the hearts and lives of men and women, and yes, in a wider sense than that, to overcome all the logic and philosophy and argumentation of the, of the ungodly world that has Satan at its back in his power. But friends, this morning this weapon has been proven. You remember the story of David and Goliath? Who hasn't read that or heard that story? In 1 Samuel 17. Young David, the stripling shepherd lad, teenager probably at that point, comes to the camp of Israel at a time when they are faced with the Philistine army and the Philistine champion Goliath of Gath, who rails against the armies of God and against the God of those armies. And you know the story of how David says, I, I'm going to fight him. <laughs> and so they, Saul, who ought to have been the champion, lets this little boy go in his place. What a chicken. But anyway, that's beside the point. <laughs> and he says, you can't go like that. I'll give you my armor. I'll speak of yourself. Thank you for that. I'll give you my armor. So they put the armor on this teenager and they give him the sword of Saul. What does David say? I can't go with these. I have not proved them. David wanted to go out against the enemy of the Lord's people with weaponry that had been proven. Something that he had personally proven. And brothers and sisters, the weapon that God has given to us to go out against the enemy of men's souls, the powers of darkness, Satan himself, is, thank God, a weapon that has been proven. The Word of God. There's a biblical example I talked earlier on about the terrible sin of the city of Corinth. Paul goes with the Gospel. He preaches Jesus Christ and Him crucified. He determines in his soul that he will not be distracted from or deviate from that message. He will keep the Gospel front and center. The declaration of Christ, the preaching of the cross, he said, it's to those that perish foolishness, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. This gospel which Paul said, and he wrote to the Romans, another epistle, he said, this gospel, it is the power of God unto salvation. That's not just a, an empty statement on Paul's part. Paul had proved this. And he proved it in Corinth. The most iniquitous and debauched culture of the time. He proved the power of this weapon. The word of God. The sword of the spirit. And where is the proof? 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 9 says. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral. There was a lot of them in Corinth. Idolaters. Adulterers, men who practice homosexuality, thieves, greedy, drunkards, revilers, swindlers, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then this, and such were some of you. Wow. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, you are sanctified, ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Amen? Amen. There's the proof. Paul walks into the city where men are in the very swamp of sin and held captive by the devil to do his will. And his weapon is not human philosophy. It is not human eloquence. It's not human oratory. He said, I, I determined to know nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. And what was it? And what was the result? Souls were liberated from the power of sin and from the power of sin. Has the word changed? That's an example from the Bible. Let me give you an example from history. This I'm done. After the overthrow of the Roman Empire, the world, the then known world, descended into what became known as the Dark Ages. Very appropriate term. 
The church that ought to have been a light to the darkness became a propagator of that darkness in preaching a false gospel and leading men astray from the truth. And then God raised up in the 16th century a man in Germany who was a monk of the Augustinian order named Martin Luther. You know the story of the Reformation. You know that the result of the Reformation, people have used the Latin term post tenebras lux to describe it. It literally means after darkness, light. And the light and truth of the gospel again was preached with all the pristine simplicity and power of the apostolic gospel. And multitudes were converted to God and whole nations were emancipated from the tyranny of thraldom and superstition and false doctrine and, 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 and spiritual liberty was established. We live today still in John's house in the legacy of that time. I want you to listen to Luther in one of his works as he described what happened. He says, I oppose indulgences and indulgences and all papists, but never by force. I simply taught, preached, wrote God's word. Otherwise, I did nothing. And then when I slept or drank Wittenberg beer with Philip of Amsdorf, the word so greatly weakened the papacy that never a prince or emperor did such damage to it. I did nothing. The word did it all. Brothers and sisters, it has been a proven weapon. And if ever there was a time when the people of God need to discover, rediscover, the powerfulness of this proven weapon it is this generation, this culture, and this society. Let us not be distracted by human wisdom, by human arguments, by human, by human attitudes, as we go forth to destroy the works of darkness. But let us take up, this is what God is calling the believers at Ephesus and us also to do, to take up this mighty weapon, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And before the power of that Word wielded in the power of the Holy Spirit, Satan's host is overcome and Satan's captives will be freed. Praise the Lord.